Welcome back to the Health Longevity Secret Show. I'm Dr. Robert Lufkin. Are supplements the key to health and longevity? Today, we find out as we interview Sandra Kaufman, MD, author of The Kaufman Protocol. Dr. Kaufman began her academic career in the field of cellular biology, earning a master's degree from the University of Connecticut and her medical degree at the University of Maryland. She completed a residency and fellowship at Johns Hopkins in pediatric anesthesiology. For the last five years, she has been chief of pediatric anesthesia at the Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital, a nationally recognized center of excellence. Most recently, she was recognized as best in medicine by the American Health Council. Now, please enjoy this interview with Sandra Kaufman, MD. Hey, Sandra, welcome to the show. <laughs> Great to be here. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us, uh, especially during this time of COVID. I, I realize in your practice, you're, you're really in the trenches there. And, and we, even, we had to reschedule this interview once before. So we, we do appreciate it. Well, I, I appreciate your uh, generosity. In fact, I was in the OR last night with a, a kid that had COVID. So uh, it, is, it is alive and well in Florida, unfortunately, but uh, hopefully we'll get a handle on it soon. So message to everyone, get their vaccines. Oh, 100%. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's no confusion there then. And, and also, at, at least we, we didn't pull you away from an expedition to the base camp of Mount Everest. <laughs> no. I, I saw yeah. that on one of your uh, other uh, uh, programs. <laughs> what, but we'll, we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> so today, we get to take a deep dive into the Kaufman protocol and understand uh, metabolism and uh, longevity genes and proteins in a way that, that I haven't before. Uh, you're the author of this book, The Kaufman Protocol, that I love. I, I, I love reading it. The detail is great for understanding these things, even for, even for uh, an introductory text, it's, it's very good. I think people uh, can learn from it uh, if they're willing to take the time to, to dive into it. Um, but before we dive into this area, maybe you could tell us, uh, take a moment to tell us a little bit about your journey from pediatric anesthesiology to being an expert in health and longevity. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of a crazy trip, I guess. Um, it has more to do with life adventures than anesthesia, I think. Uh, I was a cell biologist once upon a time before I went to med school. And as my dad pointed out, cells don't pay bills. So I just became a doctor. Um, I became an anesthesiologist because it was just really interesting in terms of pharmacology and physiology and how drugs affect people and how people affect drugs. But probably more than anything else, I'm, I'm a rock climber and a mountain climber. Uh, you referred to Base Camp Everest, and, and I did. I should have gone to the top. Um, I didn't have uh, that kind of time or cash at the time, but I just went to Base Camp, and it was amazing. And since then, I've climbed a few other uh, big ones. Uh, just uh, snuck back from Aconcagua before COVID hit, and I'm sort of waiting for the world to open up to continue my ventures. But I was hanging off of a cliff one day, I was probably in my mid forties, and I thought, I've got to stop aging or this whole fun stuff is gonna to come to a crashing halt. Um, and it seemed ridiculous at the time. People were like, really? People have been trying to you know, cure aging for 3000 years. Um, how in the world am I going to do it? But I did what I always do. You dive into reading and I flipped through a billion plus or minus uh, articles. And I realized that we actually do know why we age and there actually are really amazing things that we can do. Um, but I also realize that it's kind of chaotic. The scientific world has a zillion theories. They're all over the place and there was no directionality. It's sort of how to go about using these things on a practical basis. And so that is sort of the basis of the Kaufman protocol. What are the, yeah, I, I mean, I, I totally agree. Uh, when when I went to medical school, aging was was believed to be just sort of the cumulative, the, the accumulation of damage over time, and then our our bodies just wore out. And 
we now understand that it's it's really not that way. And what what were the the key uh, concepts uh, that that fuel this change in understanding of aging? And what are the new mechanisms uh, of aging as as you understand it? Uh, so aging, you're right. My my dad was a physician, and I would always say, "My gosh, what did that person die of?" And he said, "Old age." And I, and I always thought, well, "What does that mean?" You know, like what does it mean? And so when you look at aging, you can think of it from different perspectives. So uh, in medicine, as you probably have the same training I did, we learned about organ systems, right? You die of kidney failure or liver failure or your brain acts up. But in reality, coming from the perspective of a cell biologist, I realized that it's because your cells don't age well. And if you specifically look at all the little organelles that we sort of learned about in the fifth grade, this is the really, this is where aging lives. And it lives in all the teeny tiny mechanisms that we kind of have forgotten about, which I now obsess mercilessly over. Uh, the good news is I do it so no one else has to. Um, so my, my seven tenets of aging really revolve around cells and cells only, but this can then get extrapolated to the types of tissues um, that things tend to go wrong in. So, so what, are, what are some of those concepts of aging for the, for the cells? if we want to understand it at that level. Okay, so this is where your audience is going to get really, really bored. So I'll try to make this moderately entertaining because it's, it's pretty darn dry. Um, but tenant one has to do with your DNA. The DNA, of course, has all the instructions for what your cell needs to do in it. Um, and things go wrong in your DNA, of course. So everyone knows that your telomeres get shorter. Anytime your cell is under stress or it replicates, the telomeres get shorter. And the shorter your telomeres get, the longer or the shorter your life is going to be. It's so sort of a direct correlation. Secondly, your DNA gets uh, methylated and all sorts of horrible epigenetic things happen. So it's methylation, phosphorylation, acetylation, but it's the study of epigenetic modification, essentially. And all the bad things that you do in your life accumulate as crap, uh, pardon my lingo, all over your DNA, causing it to sort of malfunction. Uh, the other thing that happens to your DNA is it gets attacked by the outside world. Uh, free radicals attack your DNA, glucose attacks your DNA. So the third thing in this category that's sort of important is protection of your DNA. And we can talk about a few things later that actually do that. So that's tenant one. Yeah, we've, we've, our, our audience has had some exposure to DNA um, telomerase. Uh, we've had Elizabeth Parrish on the show who does uh, gene therapy for yep. telomerase reverse transcriptase. So they've heard a little bit about that. And then uh, epigenetic modifications we, we, we have had or will be hearing from Kara Fitzgerald, who's uh, doing uh, her work to show uh, DNA methylation clock reversal with lifestyle changes and, and, and some others. Uh, so they, we have had some exposure to, to that, but thank you. Yeah, yeah, but the idea is, and, and these, I love these people um, because they are amazingly brilliant. I love Liz uh, in their silos of expertise. And I always get into the wars of like, oh, aging is this. And I always say, well, aging is partly that, but it's also C, D, E, and F. So this is sort of what I do. I take all of these things and, and organize them together. So they're absolutely correct in what they're saying. I just think it's not complete. Um, but that, that's basically uh, tenant one. So tenant two has to do with energy of your cells. If you don't have energy, you're not gonna be able to do anything. So this is, of course, is the mitochondria. Mitochondria fail for many reasons, but the big ones are, uh, number one, most people by the age of 40 are nicotinamide deficient. So there's a big war right now between nicotinamide riboside and mononucleotide, because everyone knows that supplementing your NAD levels is going to help your cells. Uh, the other thing that happens in your mitochondria, of course, is oxidative damage. And your body makes free radical scavengers, but of course, over time, we don't make enough and then our DNA sort of succumbs to time damage from these little tiny microbiomes, as I call them. So we need to keep our mitochondria as healthy as possible, otherwise our cells just fail. And mitochondrial failure is one of the big reasons that women go into menopause, which clearly not your problem, but it's probably uh, mine and many other women's out there. And the longer you can keep your mitochondria up to snuff, the less likely you are to have to deal with that sort of issue. So that's really quite important. Uh, tenet three is what I call pathways. And these are pathways. So tenant two, excuse me. So tenant two is tenet sort two of is, uh, is energy. the 
uh, a lot of the Dave Sinclair things about yeah. uh, Sirtuins and NAD oh, no, no, replacements. No, 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 no. Sirtuins. We're going to get back to Sirtuins. Sirtuins okay. is three. Two is mitochondria. And, and the okay. reason you're making that jump um, is because NAD, of course, is essential in your electron transport chain, but it is also a necessary cofactor for sirtuin activation. NAD is amazingly important. So though it does those two things. Um, it does other things as well. It's a communication device in your uh, cell that tells your nucleus what your mitochondria is doing. Um, and the molecule is also taken apart and used for DNA repair. So if you have a big hole in your DNA, your body takes the NAD molecule into pieces, chunks it, glues part of it back in like, like a piece of construction work. Um, so essentially the older you get, the more NAD you need and the less you have available. So a whole lot of systems fail with NAD shortage, which is why it's always in the headlines these days. And you're right, David Sinclair is huge in this area. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so um, now we're switching to problem three, which is metabolic pathways. That is correct. Uh, there are many, many, many pathways that are related to aging. I like to classify them as the big three and people are gonna get on your show and argue that, okay, I left a few out and, and they're right, but I can't have everything, everything all the time. But the big three are number one, the sirtuins. There are seven mammalian sirtuins. Uh, and as I said before, they are NAD dependent. And of course they keep you young and they get turned off over time, which is actually an epigenetic problem, which demonstrates that all of this is very interrelated. Um, I like to tell people, I, I, I disconnect all of these things, pretending that they're not related, but in reality, it's, it's a mishmash Venn diagram sort of thing. But to keep them separate, back to sirtuins, there's seven of them, and they control a whole lot of things in your body, everything from how your mitochondria function to brown fat versus white fat to, um, oh my gosh, the, the, the list is endless. But anything when you think about aging is basically controlled by your sirtuins. So that's really important. The second one in this category, of course, is AMP kinase. And this is a measure of how much energy your cell has, right? There's the ratio of AMP to ATP. ATP, uh, of course, adenosine triphosphate that everyone knows about. AMP, so when your triphosphates run out, so you only have one. So it's monophosphate to triphosphate. Um, so when your energy is perceived as being low, the cell changes its metabolism, puts itself in a state of hibernation, and it encourages longevity. Uh, and the cool thing about this is this is why all of the caloric restriction diets work. Because as soon as you limit energy to cells, it turns on the AMP kinase and the whole system gets activated. So people love restriction diets. Um, I can't do it myself because I'm too much, uh, <laughs> I can't do it. Um, that being said, a lot of people have fantastic results. And I'm sure you've got some dietitians on there talking about how to do it and when to do it and all the sort of intricate details, but that's not my thing. Um, sure, yeah, the, uh, for the people in our program, at least our speakers, there seems to be a consistent agreement that, you know, sirtuin, uh, sirtuins, mTOR, and AMP kinase are, are the three at least major gene protein ones. And like you say, it's interesting. They have many functions, but a prominent one is nutrient sensing and regulating that metabolic switch from ketosis to glucose metabolism back and forth. But we'll, we can get, we'll get... We'll return to that a little bit later. Why don't you continue? Sure. So as you said, the last big one in this three, of course, is the mTOR system. And this is a bit backwards compared to the other ones. So the other ones sense nutrients and stop moving. mTOR just keeps building. It's sort of like the youthful pathway. And unfortunately, cells don't always want to be pushed to be youthful as they get older because they just can't do it. So it forces cells to hypertrophy anomalously. It can cause high blood pressure. It can cause a whole lot of problems. So in a sense, we kind of want to turn the mTOR pathway off as we get older, um, which leads us, of course, to the controversial discussion of rapamycin, which some people love and adore, and I think comes at a cost that maybe you have to sort of understand before you undertake such therapy. Um, because rapamycin basically is an immunosuppressant and it, per it stops fast turnover cells which is fantastic. Uh, if you look at mice and, and rodents on uh, rapamycin, it really does slow down aging. Uh, their coats are better, their activity levels better, all sorts of things are better. However, um, it does lead to sarcopenia because your muscle cells aren't turning over and it leads to hippocampal loss. So mm. memories suffer significantly. Um, and so that is just something people need to consider when they're determining whether or not they want to take uh, the rapamycin. Are those uh, hippocampal volume loss, uh, is that 
determined from MRIs of patients that are taking rapamycin for organ rejection suppression? So you can see it in all sorts of types of studies. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the biggest thing that you actually see is if you give it to rodents, and everyone's going to argue, well, we're not a rodent. But there's probably six or seven different types of memory that they can test for, and they're all negatively affected by rapamycin. So it's clinical as well as physical. Mm, mm, interesting. And then there's always that, that the question about the dosage, you know, the, the clinical organ suppression dose is much higher and continuous than the, than the longevity dose, which is again, an, an off-label FDA use, which we're not advocating, but we've had other speakers discussing it. And then they, they give sort of a pulsed, uh, right. pulsed dose type uh, approach, but. Well, I, I sort of think that partial mTOR inhibition is very useful, and I think one has to be very careful with it. The good news is that a lot of the other things that people use are, in fact, partial mTOR inhibitors. So metformin, I'm a huge fan of, um, and it's a partial mTOR inhibitor. So I think a reasonable dose of metformin can actually cover for your not taking rapamycin. Um, but again, like, everyone's going to have a differing opinion on this, and we don't really know for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and and we, we can get to this later, but the the issue is uh, monitoring response and with the longevity treatment, what are your endpoints if you can't actually measure longevity? But let's let's set that aside. We can come back to that. Um, and uh, so we we just done number three. Um, and then number four would be the quality problems with DNA repair. That is correct. So quality control. And for people that are sort of following along, this is based on a factory model. So if things seem sort of factory-like, uh, that's what this is. So um, in my world, you have to check your widgets. So in cells, uh, there are 10 to the fifth, that's a lot, DNA errors per cell per day. And we have very specific DNA repair mechanisms, which of course fail over time. And plus DNA damage actually goes up over time. Um, so the ability to fix it fails and so cells malfunction. Um, What's really amazing is there actually are agents out there that increase our DNA repair mechanisms. So that's sort of why it's listed. Uh, there's also protein failure. Um, a cell's one and only job is to make proteins, as far as I'm concerned, they're little protein factories. And when they start putting out widgets that don't work or you know, proteins that are non-functional, um, we need to either stop the production, fix it, et cetera. And that, that's all doable um, with, with supplements. The other thing I put in this category is autophagy. I think recycling is sort of falls into the category of quality control. And we all know that um, autophagy is extraordinarily important in terms of turnover of organelles to make the cell more efficient over time. Um, yeah, big thing I mean, in the category, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say the big one in this category, just so I can get it thrown in there, of course, is spermidine. It's probably the strongest autophagy stimulator that we have. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll hold my comment for later on uh, on autophagy. But we can come Anyways. back to that. Yeah. Anyway, so let's see that we are on five now. Yeah, right? inflammatory issues. So right. So this is your immune system, and your immune system is amazingly helpful when you are younger, but it fails over time, leading to systemic inf inflammation. So people don't necessarily think these two things are connected, but they are. It's just two ends of a spectrum. So by the time you get older, your immune system fails, your ability to make, um, uh, have responses to vaccines, for example, fails, which is what we're seeing now needing the, the third dose. Um, and the chronic inflammation that your body is put in is overwhelming. And this leads to so many breakdown uh, things around the body. Um, all the itises, my back hurts, uh, every itis, all the like the bone problems, this, that, the other, neuroinflammation, et cetera, it's all related to a rise in your inflammatory system, which the good news is we can sort of turn off as well. So that is, what are we on? That's five. Uh, yeah, it's interesting that, that um, aging and some of the underlying metabolic processes associated with, with that are now linked to diseases that in the past, you know, like arthritis, uh, which just sort of, it, at one point was thought of as kind of a wear and tear disease, general osteoarthritis, but now it, it's seen as an inflammatory condition that has roots in metabolic disease and these longevity uh, genetic uh, processes. 
Oh, without a doubt. It's, it's truly amazing. In fact, the people that made these names are really bright. And it, whenever I look up something that says itis at the end, of course, you know, it's, it, it's, in, it's an inflammatory problem. And when you measure the cytokines and all the interleukins, they're all elevated. And as soon as you put someone on a program to reduce those things, um, they're, they're, all of the inflammations go down and people just feel so much better. So one of the things about all of this is that people frequently say, well, I don't really want to live forever. And my response is, well, how about we just live better, right? So if we can just sort of um, make disease better, longevity sort of comes along with that. And as physicians, that's sort of our job, right? Preventative medicine, understanding disease, and just making people's lives better. So I, I think that's yeah. just sort of an important piece to throw in there. Um, and and, and, and uh, aging is the single uh, greatest risk factor for most of the chronic diseases we, we have increased age. Oh, yeah. And so if you can control the aging mechanisms, then these chronic diseases would would decrease in incidence, hopefully. Although a very uh, obnoxious friend of mine always points out that the greatest risk factor for death is birth. <laughs> Good like, point. Well, can't help that one. Uh, anyway, so let's see, tenant six, I call individual uh, cell requirements. And the reason I throw this in there, my factory model, this is, of course, is, is the personnel. And they're very different, right? There's the, the, the summer employee that comes in, works a few hours, doesn't do a whole lot. And then there's the, the person that's been in the office for 80 years, knows everything, gets a little senescent sometimes. And so cells are just like these people. Um, like a red cell floats around for three months, bone cells are around for about 10 years, and brain cells are around absolutely forever. So all of those things have different specific requirements. Um, in addition, I throw in senescent cells and then I throw in stem cells in this category because those two uh, have very specific requirements, one in terms of increasing its longevity and the other in terms of getting rid of it, right? Because we don't really want our senescent cells and we, we can touch on that in a bit. Uh, but that, that's basically individual cell needs. And then uh, the last one is waste management. Again, back to the factory model, you have to take out the garbage. Um, and this is basically glucose issues for the most part, because anytime glucose gets into the body, it just causes trouble. I tell people that it's sticky outside and it's sticky inside. And of course, it sticks to other molecules, creating advanced glycation end products or AGEs, which my, is my favorite uh, abbreviation ever. Um, and AGEs just cause problems all over the body. They're inflammatory. They break up tissues. They're just evil, evil beasts. Um, and I have this theory that we're all pre-diabetic, even if our glucose levels are reasonably low. And I take a zillion things to sort of block the AGE production. Uh, the other thing in this category, which is sort of a, a tuck in, is, is the accumulation of lipofusion. Only because it accumulates with age, it's garbage, and it's really hard to get rid of. Uh, I also think it's cool because this is how you can um, age lobsters because they have the same lipo, uh, lipofusion accumulation as we do. So if you ever want to know how old a lobster is, just look at its lipofusion accumulation. Oh, interesting, interesting. I, now, I, I thought I heard lobsters had negligible senescence. Is that right? That they, um, they, they age rapidly at the end, but they don't have a, a normal life going up, a normal aging process going up like that? I have no idea. It's a good question. Anyway, never mind. I, thought, I think we eat them before they get that old. I don't, I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> they, they, we never, they're never around long enough to find out. <laughs> um, but anyway, so in, in a nutshell, I think that those pretty much encompass every reason that we age. Um, people are going to be very picky about other things uh, that I have not necessarily included, but they all tuck into one of these reasons. Like people talk about issues with protein production, and obviously that falls into um, quality control and, and anyway, so various experts have decided that different things should fit along in different categories. But in general, as a place to start, this was my organizational system because, you know, disorganization is just, is just horrible. So this is now organized. Um, and then the other thing that I did, which I, I think is very important, at least for the clinical aspect is of course the Kaufman rating system. And I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I think I think it's a great approach because you you, you you've taken a, a basic model where you analyze the mechanism and then you analyze certain molecular agents and then can apply uh, this system to uh, really personalize it to each individual. Because the, the the problem I think a lot of us are seeing is that there are different camps for approaches to health and longevity. And like you say, there's a low carb camp and there's a 
you know, uh, a metformin camp or a rapamycin camp, and you could give the same drugs to three different, five different people, and you'll get five different responses. And we all know as physicians that, that there's great individual variability. So this is a way, a way to get at that. And I, I think it's, 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 it's genius. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so what's actually kind of funny is when I started doing this is I would read about all the reasons as you age, and then it would use something as an example. For example, everyone loves resveratrol in these examples or astaxanthin. And so I had this huge piece of paper grid on my desk because uh, I'm old school. I don't, you know, hate making things on spreadsheets. So I, you know, my piece of paper, my stupid lines, and it sort of with checks, like does it do anything in this category? Check, 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 oh, big negative. And then I would find something that really was truly amazing. I'm like, ooh, check, check, that's amazing. And that was like, check, check, check. I'm like, okay, this is just becoming absurd. So I decided to make it formalized. So if an agent did something in a category, um, uh, basically it was, it's, it's rated from zero to three. If it does absolutely nothing, it's a zero. If it does something in theory or in culture or in a test tube, it got a one. If there was evidence in rodents or any mammal that wasn't human, it got a two. And if there was human evidence, it got a three. So then every agent now has seven digits associated with it, which then meant not aging sort of became a mathematical algorithm, which is so much easier than having to rethink through all of this all the time. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great approach. You mentioned some of the tools you use as molecular agents. You mentioned resveratrol, metformin, NAD supplements. What are some of the other ones and what are the strategies that you use with them? So that is a huge question. So there's 15 agents in the book and I'm, um, I'm about to put out book two and it has another 28. Um, and the idea is everyone, depending on how old you are and who you are, would benefit from some combination thereof. And I certainly don't suggest that everyone take all of them because that's a little bit much. But the idea is that people have uh, the education and the ability to pick what's right for them. And based on what diseases you have, how old you are, et cetera, you weight one category over another, right? So if you're just, if you're a normal, healthy 40 year old and you have nothing going on at all, you just need to cover all the bases reasonably uh, equally, which, which led to the development of them called that I call the panacea. And, and clearly it's not really a panacea, but the letters kind of spelled it out. So I thought that was cool um, a bunch of years ago. So basically it's, it's pterostilbene because uh, it's a big sirtuin activator and, and it does a variety of other things as well. Uh, it's either that or resveratrol be the, the top choice. It is just, um, Terastilbene has better bioavailability. People argue that if you have uh, any lipid problems, you should do the resveratrol instead, but then you need something that's more bioavailable, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, but one of those two things to get your sirtuins moving, um, that's P in the panacea. A is astaxanthin. Uh, anyone knows me knows that astaxanthin is my all time favorite molecule because it's the coolest thing in the world. Uh, my kids call it the angry algae uh, thing because when you piss off algae, it creates these molecular globs and they are bright in color. They're orangish, pinkish. Um, and what it does for uh, algae is, is what same thing it does for us. It protects us um, from radiation and free radicals. Stuff's amazing. Uh, I frequently tell people, I give it to my 15 year old tennis player who is a redhead. And when she takes it, she doesn't burn in the sun. It's really, really remarkable. Wow. Um, but it protects all of your body. It's truly amazing. There's no, there's no downside. It's an anti-inflammatory as well, although not quite as potent. Um, and also, so in the mitochondria category, it is a free radical scavenger unto itself, and it also increases your own uh, endogenous uh, scavengers, like your SODs and your catalase, peroxidases, et cetera. That's one thing. Let's see, that's uh, PA. N, uh, nicotinamide, right? Everyone over 40, as I said, needs to be on some form of nicotinamide. Um, there are serious wars being raged about what type to be on. I'm sure you've had your experts on. There's the nasal sprays and the patches and the this and the IV drips and the pills and blah, 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 blah. I don't really know if one is better than the other, although all the companies have tried to convince me of such. I don't think it really matters as long as you take something. Um, as far as the oral ones, uh, do you have a preference NMN or NMR? I've, I've tried them both and I haven't really seen any evidence that one is better than the other. I sort of bounce back and forth a bit. Um, What's your endpoint? Just feeling, or I mean, uh, with a lot of these, it's hard to track unnecessarily biomarkers, right? For for NAD supplements, 
what's the end point other than a subjective feeling of, well, I, you know, I have more energy or something, or what, what, how do you, how do you track response? So you, to... can actually, you can actually measure your NAD levels right, all right. Tests for 300 bucks or something yeah. and, and you, you can do it. Um, have I done it? No. Uh, I've been on NAD for so long. I'm not really sure what it would tell me. Um, I do, however, when I get sick or I have less energy, I tend to up the dose a bit or I'll switch it up. You know, is it placebo? I really have no way of knowing. Um, if I'm out in the sun a bit, I need more DNA damage repair. I'll take a bit. Um, so I you take it, one it, gram a day, uh, oh gosh, one gram. No, How no, much no. you take a day? Probably half of that, about 500. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I think that if you're, if you're deficient and you need to, well, if you think of it as a vitamin, right? Um, if you are extremely deficient, you want to bolish yourself up until you hit some sort of homeostasis, and then you can back off the dose and just take it, um, you know, a little bit less all the time. So since I've been on this now for years, I take a decent amount, um, like once a week, and then just like standard dose every day. Okay. okay. Right. So I tell people, bolus up your levels, come down to a homeostasis, and then level out. And the starting dose and the bolus dose depends on how old you are, what your medical problems are, and how long um, you've been on other things. You know what I mean? Like if you've been on sirtuin activators and you're not on nicotinamide, it's not doing squat. So as soon as you have some nicotine in your body, nicotinamide in your body, it's going to start to get sucked into one area versus another. So I think that you need a bigger bolus for a longer period of time to sort of get started. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? mm -hmm. This, yeah. this, this is where anesthesia plays a, plays a role, right? It's all about pharmacodynamics exactly. and, and, and all that you're, stuff. You're the perfect person for doing this. <laughs> it's a weird set of skills, right? Uh, <laughs> let's see. Mo moving down the list, panacea, we get to the, the C's. And curcumin is one of the best natural anti-inflammatories that there is. Um, I'm not a homeopath in any way, shape, or form, but I think that this is just an amazing molecule. Uh, very little side effects. Of course, the, the challenge is the bioavailability. Um, so I use one that's in a nanomycel and I know it works because if I take more than two, I turn bright yellow. So it is definitely getting into my body. Um, also as a rock climber, I beat the crap out of my body. And when I don't take this, I hurt like hell. And when I do take it, I'm perfectly fantastic. So I know it works. Oh. Huh. Um, and then the last one in the panacea is carnosine because everyone has glucose issues and carnosine um, is a fantastic transglycosylating agent. So when you take it, it bonds with the glucose and it can't necessarily take the glucose or take the AG off of your tissues, but it can definitely decrease the formation of, of AGs. Mm, mm. Wow. So that is top five for anyone that's sort of new to the program over the age of 40. Uh, beyond that, uh, then we start catering to people's individual needs. Um, Easy examples. If you are prone to sun damage, then clearly you need to increase your um, DNA repair mechanism. So something like calipodium or AC11 is the way you want to go. If you have um, osteoarthritis, for example, it's an inflammatory issue. So you want to max out on category five. Um, if you are history of, of diabetes, family history of diabetes, that sort of thing, then we max out on agents that hit category seven for waste management. Um, there are a million and one ways to block AGE production. Um, so it's just hmm. a matter of picking and choosing how avidly one wants to chase these problems um, to determine sort of what their ideal protocol is. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful system that, that, like we said, allows you to personalize the approach there. I'm wondering, um, even though these, other than the metformin, I think, uh, are all... Uh, non-prescription or they're over the counter uh, over the counter supplements and such do you recommend that that a person do this by themselves or do it with a health coach or with a physician it seems like there's a lot of complexities and and variabilities here uh, to be looked at what what's the uh, ideal way to administer this program so that is an excellent question and it's sort of a trick question um, I would love, as a physician, to say, go to your physician's office and sit down and figure this out. But physicians, again, they work by organ systems, and they're, re um, they're reactive instead of proactive in general. Cl clearly, not everyone. But they wait for you to get a disease, and then they try to treat it. Longevity medicine is about looking into the future and trying to avoid things. And most physicians today just don't have that insight. 
Um, I think over time they will. And one of the reasons I like doing shows like this is to try to create, create a system where physicians do understand that this is not hocus pocus. This is real medicine. It needs to be incorporated. Um, but what that means for regular people today is a little bit tough. So if people are educated in the longevity world, they can certainly undertake this on their own. And if they want a little help, I am out there and I'm more than happy to help people figure this out. Um, my email address is on my website, which is very easy because it's kaufmanprotocol.com. And the email is on there and I answer everyone's questions. It, sometimes it takes me a bit of time to get to, but if people send me like a brief sentence about who they are or what they want to do, what they're trying to accomplish, I'm happy to set programs up for people. You mentioned, um, as we were talking before offline, uh, about an app that was in development or that you were considering. Is that something that you plan on bringing out uh, as a software tool for people to help them in this situation? Right. So we put an app out a few years ago. And the unfortunately, the company that we chose to put it out probably was uh, the wrong company. And it had a lot of issues. And every time we paid to fix it, it just had more issues. And every time I talked about it, people would try to do it and some percentage would just have horrible issues. So I don't tend to send people to it at the moment. Um, that being said, we are incorporating into a big company called Worldwide Strategies Group and they are going to fix the app. It's in process now. So when all of this gets announced, then I will be encouraging people to sort of turn to that. But I don't want people to waste their money right now because it's, it's, it's just not working as well as it should, but it will be, mm -hmm. it's not yet. Yeah, it sounds like the app would be a good idea. And then, and then with the new book, um, going from 15 agents to how many, 25 in the new one? I, I think I overshot. I think I got to 28. I was going to go to 30, and then I just I disqualify things. Um, everyone sends me, oh, you need to check out my favorite agent. And I look at it, and I look at many, many things. It has to do many things in many categories. There has to be a lot of evidence. Um, it has to be reasonably affordable and it has to be obtainable. Uh, for example, there are some fantastic things that you just can't get. There's something called pianol and it comes from China and I can get it in a cream. It increases epidermal uh, stem cell health. It's amazing, but it is a pain in the butt to get. And if I tell people to get it, they're just going to go crazy and I'm going to get, you know, my no door knocked down. You told me to take this and, uh, right. The certain things got rolled out. So there are 28 agents. Um, and within those agents, I also talk about other things. For example, everyone's worried about skin. So we talk about things like hyaluronic acid and collagen and what they actually do do for your tissues and your skin. Um, the other thing is I'm introducing some new concepts. Uh, I, I couldn't put too much in the first book because it was just going to be incredibly drab. I mean, it's pretty boring as it is now, but uh, there's even more boring stuff coming. Um, I talk about something called the mitochondrial transition pore. Um, it, it sort of flutters on and off. It's like a pop-off valve in your mitochondria. And when your cell is under stress, it opens a bit, uh, leaves some pressure, and then your mitochondria go back to, goes back to functioning. Unfortunately, under a decent amount of stress, it just blows open. Um, and it's kind of like opening up mitochondrial floodgates. All these horrible cytotoxins pour into your cell. The cell doesn't do very well. It sort of blows up, undergoes apoptosis, and you got a dead cell in your hands. Um, so by controlling the mitochondrial pore, uh, you can actually delay cell death and sort of make it better. So I'm introducing concepts such as that as you sort of read along. So it's not just an encyclopedia for the agents, it's also education as, as you go through it. So in addition to increasing the number of agents, um, you add on these new concepts, but the fundamental um, overall concepts of the original book remain in place oh, and it's just expanded expanded on those. Your, your thinking really hasn't changed necessarily about that. How did you, um, where do you go for your knowledge about this? Is it mainly from the, obviously the scientific uh, and medical literature? Do you, do you go to certain conferences you find valuable uh, in this space or um, what, what, how are you able to uh, get on top of a, the, such, a, such a diverse and changing area of knowledge? So that's, so that's actually a really good question. By the time information makes it to um, a conference, um, it's kind of old hat, to be honest with you. So what I, I troll the most esoteric literature that you would ever find. Um, absolutely just crazy. It, and what usually happens is there'll be a plant from 
East craziness somewhere that no one's ever heard of, right? And some culture seems to think that it increases longevity. And some crazy scientist that you've never heard of spent his life isolating that one little itty bitty thing. And then someone else looked at it. And then it just sort of grows and grows and grows and it starts catching on in, in the literature. But it's very kind of hard to find. And I have just uncovered amazing little agents that are really just underappreciated because they're in a little tiny corner of the world. Like, um, like what are some examples? Like, like one of my favorite ones is something called delphinidin. Um, it comes from the Mackay berry in Chile and Argentina. And, <laughs> and I wouldn't have known about it except I, I went hiking um, in Southern Patagonia a few years ago. I, I actually traversed the Southern Patagonian ice field. Um, it was cold. <laughs> and, um, but everyone's like, oh, you got to try this stuff. It's delphinidin. I'm like, what the hell is that? Turns out it's the most amazing free radical scavenger. It's water soluble. So it, it, it uh, sort of um, astaxanthin is oil soluble. So this one's water soluble. So it gets to different aspects of your cell. And it's just an outstanding free radical scavenger. It's amazing. But who's ever heard of the mycide berry, right? Huh. Huh. So it's kind of cool, right? And then when I was up uh, in the Himalayas, people were popping uh, shilajit. I'm probably saying that incorrectly, um, which dawned on me. It's sort of the equivalent of Fred Flintstone mountain vitamins. It's just loaded with amazing free radical scavengers and chelators. And these people swear that it makes them stronger. And now there's actually evidence that it does make people stronger. It's, it's, it's truly remarkable. Um, there's something else called saladrocide comes from uh, plants up in the high mountains. And what's amazing is that the Sherpas take it. Huh. And huh. what we finally came to realize is it changes the subunits in your cytochrome. Specifically, cytochrome C is changed out in people that take this. And you can actually do way better at high altitudes on saladrocide. And, and it's real, it's not, it's not imaginary. It's, it's absolutely mitochondrial real. Um, the other neat thing is it changes how your brain processes neurotransmitters and it's used as a, a natural antidepressant. Wow, uh, wow. So there's all of these little things from corners of the world and, and as soon as you dive into them, they're just unbelievably remarkable. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's fascinating how the things out of history, like, like in the Ayurvedic tradition, ashwagandha and that you know have results from the past and and now that we can see how they work and then and then completely new things that were unexpected like well like rapamycin you know from right, right. Uh, well, you from know that, do you know where rapamycin came from yeah easter it's island so but cool. i don't think I, I don't think rapa nui yeah but maybe yeah. tell the story because I, we haven't discussed it with our listeners on this show if you if you want to it's such a good oh, story it's just a sentence or two i just think this is truly amazing so there was a uh, bacteria growing near those big old statues and they took it and they cultured it and they found that rapamycin um uh what was it, it blocked it was it's just the, the key to mTOR right it's mechanistic Oh shoot, I'm totally blanking. Yeah, it's the mech. Well, M mTOR was the mechanistic target of rapamycin. Oh, rapamycin. Yes. Right. And it's how and they discovered the entire pathway. Right. Exactly. So, you know, thank you to big giant statues. It's amazing where this stuff comes from, right? Yeah, and the the actual the the organism that it, they cultured it or that they grew it that produced the rapamycin. Um, when they brought it back, it was a, uh, it was basically used by a company to develop it, and then the companies went out of business or they got bought, and they said just discard discard the sample. And the scientist who was working on it, I'm blanking on his name, but he put it in his in his refrigerator and refused to throw it away. And he went and worked for another company, and finally, a few years later, I, I can't even remember if it was the same company, but basically after his actions of saving it, he brought it back out and revived it and started testing it. And then it sort of triggered this whole understanding of mTOR, like you say, and, and sort of a revolution in longevity. I actually did not know that part. That's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> but, but it's just, it, it's truly amazing where, where these things come from. Like one of my new favorite agents is something called spermidine. It, you know, it's, it's in sperm. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. Is. And, yeah. It, and it's, to, it's, yeah, to tell us why it's so, uh, so uh, interesting. Well, I, I think it's amazing, right? Because it was sort of discovered by von Liebenhoek in the 1600s, right? And then they say it very, very uh, 
flatly, right? Yeah, but even the discover of business is on. You, you kind of wonder, like, what was he doing, right? <laughs> yeah, that was one of the first things he observed, right? I think, right, right. right? Yeah. <laughs> what would make him so so bizarrely human and like more more approachable? Because clearly uh -huh. he wasn't looking around for other people's specimens, right? He's like, I don't know, right. right here. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, but he's it's, very um, excited by his work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very excited. Yes. <laughs> and it's related molecularly to these other great molecules, um, like um, uh, what is it? Putrescence is like a few few molecules off, and cadaverine. Yeah. These great, horrible, terrible sounding names. It's marvelous. But but spermidine is just miraculous because um, it's an epigenetic modifier, uh, which is really cool. Uh, it affects the P300 system, which then increases autophagy, which is really cool. But my favorite favorite thing. It's a positively charged um, amine, uh, it's a polyamine, and it's a long chain, and it, it loves to line up with the negative grooves in DNA. There's major and minor grooves that's all negatively charged, and this molecule just sort of wraps itself in there, and it protects it. Um, and I've decided that it's bubble wrapping your DNA. <laughs> and if you put DNA in a test tube with this stuff, it protects it from radiation, and it protects it from free radicals. Now, I don't actually know if it does it in your cells, but there's no reason to think that it wouldn't. Um, and I've run this by some, you know, a few DNA experts and hey, they laugh at me first. They're like, really, Sandy, DNA bubble wrap? And I'm like, yeah. And then they think about it and they go, all right, you're not so stupid after all. So I really <laughs> think that it's a protectant of your DNA that we have not been aware of before that is truly extremely important in the longevity field. Wow! Wow! That's I, I I I wasn't aware of all that detail. That's fascinating. Well, knowing knowing what you know, how do you how do you apply this to yourself? Um, what what aspects of the protocol do you use, and and what other what other choices do you make in your own life? <laughs> Good question. So I have this theory. It's sort of like the 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 triangular theory of longevity, right? There's stuff that you do all the time at the bottom, stuff that you do sometimes, and then stuff that like you do every once in a while, right? So at the bottom, I've been avid exerciser. I love exercising. I don't get to do as much as I used to because I have three jobs, but I absolutely love it. Rock climber, mountain climber. I, I just, I, I adore it. I swim a ton. Um, unfortunately- like a daily thing or, or whenever you can fit it in? You can... No, I, I do something every day. Um, I only get to climb big mountains once a year. Uh, but I rock climb all the time. My hands look horrific because of it. Um, but otherwise I'm swimming or at the gym or, or whatever it is. And I think it just makes people feel better and you do better and whatever. So that, that, that's a baseline thing. But in no way am I going to dictate how people exercise because I'm totally not an exercise physiologist. Um, diet would be next, but I'm the world's worst eater. So I really don't want to offer any advice on that because I just get in trouble all the time for saying things that people get angry about. But moving along. I take a lot of oral supplements. Um, I probably take 50 a day, which is probably a bit much. However, I feel that I can't recommend things to people if I haven't already tried them myself. Um, and every time I go to get rid of one, I read up on it and I think, how could I possibly get rid of that? It does these amazing things. Um, I probably don't take the recommended dose because I think that they're probably a little bit too big. So I tend to take a fraction of it, but I do it every day. And so instead of taking a full dose of a free radical scavenger, I'll take like a third of a dose, but then I'll take three different types of free radical scavengers. Um, and I also spread them out during the day because most of these things, half-lives are pretty short. You're lucky if anything has a half-life of six to eight hours. So mm. if you take everything in the morning, by the time you get to the evening, you're unprotected. So there's like the morning pile, the mid-afternoon, and then the evening pile. Um, and I decided at some point that I look like an old lady with my drug boxes. So I actually decided, I created something that I call, and I have one to show you, call it the stack. So they come, they come apart, and so these little containers, so I have my little, little pills. When I travel, I take my stack. So it's super easy and organized, and I don't look like an old person. It's a great idea. Wow. I love fantastic? it. And the idea yeah. was to sort of, you know, have these at conferences and stuff, and then as soon as I bought them, the conferences stopped. So they'll be able to be able as soon as conferences are sort of up and running again. Um, <laughs> so I do do that every day, come hell or high water. Um, and then in terms of intermittent therapy, I probably take polypeptides once a month. I probably take exosomes uh, every month or two. Um, 
I do red light therapy every day and I've yet to graduate to gene therapy, but I'm sure Liz at some point uh, will talk me into that. <laughs> and no IV uh, NAD supplements or no IV things. It's all oral. Uh... I, I think that the IV stuff is, it's a fantastic, um, I didn't say this because someone's going to shoot me. Uh, if you are extraordinarily deficient, maybe it's helpful. But in general, like no one's ever come to the emergency room dying of an NAD deficiency or glutathione deficiency. It, it just doesn't happen. So it probably takes a good 10 days to uh, make up any supplement deficiencies. So if you're willing to wait the time, it is far cheaper um, to take things by mouth. I know it's mm. fancy and people love getting IVs. And I probably put in literally 30 IVs a day in people. So it's honestly not a huge deal for me. But people are just paying fifteen hundred bucks, two thousand dollars for these infusions, and it's entirely unnecessary as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's good to know. Well, whatever you're doing, keep it up. You look, you look great, and uh, it's working. Um, <laughs> and and you mentioned before, uh, how could people follow you on social media and maybe uh, give us your the website one more time so that everybody can find it. Sure. So the website, I'm so unoriginal. It's uh, calfinprotocol.com. Um, and it basically is very simple. It has the seven tenants and a variety of the agents on there with some instructions as how to, how to create your own program. And then on Instagram, I am Kaufman Anti-Aging, and I usually post um, anything interesting that I'm doing. I, I don't like, you know, take a picture of me standing there doing nothing kind of bullshit. But if I'm in a conference or I think something's interesting, uh, I'll, I'll throw it up there. Mm -hmm. oh, and I okay. also will admit that my 15 year old runs my Instagram account. So if anyone has any questions, you're going to get filtered through a kid. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's great. Well, and, and thanks so much for taking the time to spend with us today, Sandy. And, and I, I hope, I, I hope want to stay in touch with you and hopefully when the new book comes out, we can get you back on the program to uh, talk about that some more. Oh, it would be my absolute pleasure. It's so much fun, and uh, you're, you're you're fantastic to talk to. This has been great. I'll, we'll talk to you again soon. No, this is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking of it because of something you have seen here. If you find this to be of value of you, please hit that like button and subscribe to support the work we do on this channel. Also, we take your suggestions and advice very seriously. Please let us know what you'd like to see on this channel. Thanks for watching and we'll hope to see you next time.